welcome and uh, welcome to this uh, uh, special meeting of our international uh, law workshop in the Tel Aviv University uh, Law School, um, uh, which is dedicated to the prospects of the pandemic treaty. Um, my name is Eyal Gross, and in a minute I'll, I'll introduce uh, our other important people who are here with us. So um, on 24th of February and also last week, actually just a week ago on the 14th and 15th of March, is the intergovernmental negotiating body to draft and negotiate a WH convention agreement or other international instrument on pandemic prevention, preparedness and response, very long name. In short, the International Negotiating Body or the INB for the pandemic treaty held its first meeting. And this followed on the World Health Assembly decision in a special session uh, of the World Health Assembly that was held in November and obviously followed the COVID-19 pandemic to open this process of creating a pandemic treaty. Uh, now, um, the WHO, the World Health Organization has lawmaking power, which includes the possibility to adopt a convention, which in fact, so or a treaty uh, so far only occurred only once uh, with the uh, framework convention for tobacco control um, but it also has the ability to adopt binding regulation which happened uh, twice and the most relevant for our case is the second one which is international health regulation uh, in fact um, the world health assembly uh, decision uh, was to establish as i mentioned before the international negotiating body to draft and negotiate a convention agreement or other international instrument on pandemic prevention with a view to adoption under Article 19 or under other provision of the WHO Constitution. Why am I citing this? Because under Article 19, that would mean a treaty, a convention, but the decision left the door open to you know, other ways to uh, adopt a document under other provision of the WHO Constitution. So another possible, uh, uh, provision of the WHO Constitution could be Article 21, which allows the WHO to issue regulations. Um, now, uh, there are some important differences between a treaty under Article 19 and regulation under Article 21. One important difference is the states have to opt in for a treaty, but have to actively opt out from regulation. So if those will be regulation, states will have actively have to opt out. But people kind of, I think, assume that we are talking about a treaty because we already have regulations and we'll talk about the relationship between them during this uh, panel. So in any case, if the process succeeds, this may be the most important reform in global health law since the entry into form um, uh, of the current international health regulations in 2005. Mm -hmm. The 2005 international health regulations provide the normative framework for reporting on eruption of diseases that can potentially be a public health um, um, emergency of international concern for the declaration of a public health uh, emergency of international concern, which occurred six times since the new regulations came into force most recently with COVID-19. They provide the possibility to issue recommendation by the WHO about these diseases. And it is a very complex document that includes models of surveillance and global health security, but also protection of human rights, of trade and of travel and a complex relationship between uh, those different uh, pillars, if you want to call them this way. The pandemic treaty seems to be from now, at least an idea that people project a lot of aspiration towards. Um, I guess people want it to include things which are not covered in the international health regulation. If we see the different literature and idea, issues that come up of our prevention of new epidemics, possibly through a one health approach we'll be hearing about, a more robust protection of rights. Some want to, it to include equitable access to medication and vaccines and many more with the question remaining what at all, if anything, of all those noble dreams will in fact find itself into this proposed pandemic treaty. The preliminary timetable adopted in the international uh, intergovernmental negotiating body is quite intense with nine meetings of the international negotiating body planned over the next two years, aiming to reach a consensus text of an instrument by March 2024 and bringing it to the World Health Assembly in May 2024. As I said, this development may become, if it will actually occur, the most important shift in global health law uh, since the major rewriting of the health regulations in 2005. Indeed, the relationship between the proposed treaty and the international health regulation, uh, which may also be facing reform soon, are still unclear, 
and this is definitely one of the contested issues. Do we need, uh, you know, a, a treaty in addition to regulations? What will be the relationship between them? If indeed we will have a treaty rather than new regulations or in addition to new regulations. Today we are holding a panel for experts to discuss a prospect for the pandemic treaty. It is the third special panel on global health law we are holding as part of Tel Aviv University International Law Workshop since the eruption of COVID-19. The first one was held in April 2020, early on in the pandemic, and the second a year ago. I want to acknowledge my, the two co-conveners of the International Law Works who are here, obviously, Eliav Liblich and um, Natalie Davidson. Uh, we're also uh, co-hosting the event with the uh, Tel Aviv University Law School Program in Law and Health, which we are sort of really just soft launching today, which is a way to bring together the teaching, research, and events we hold on this topic at Tel Aviv University Law School. And you can already visit dedicated website of the program, which has uh, you're welcome to visit. And hopefully we'll be holding a future events. And I want to acknowledge Melanie Levy uh, here, with, with, here with us, which together to me co-direct the program. I will very shortly introduce our speakers. You can find a lot of information about them on the web. So I'll make it very short and then each of them will speak for 10 minutes. So we'll have time for discussion. So um, the four speakers in, 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 in this order are Mark Eccleston Turner, who is a senior lecturer in global health law at King's College. He was already our guest in the international law work workshop a few years ago before COVID-19 when we were happy to have him visit us in Tel Aviv, way before those topics were uh, highly, uh, of high interest to uh, people around the globe, uh, where it was really a niche topic, but we already identified this topic and had him visit us a few years back. Uh, among his books are Infectious Diseases in the New Millennium, Legal and Ethical Challenges, and more recently, Declaring a Public Health Emergency of International Concern Between International Law and Politics. After him, we we'll speak Nisin Ramakrishan, who is Assistant Professor of International Law at um, the School of Ethics, Governance, Culture, and Social System at Chinmayaya Vishwa Vidyapis. I apologize for very hard for me to pronounce university. He is recently co-author of a third world network report entitled proposed for a WHO treaty of pandemic raises concerns. Uh, then we will have um, Professor Holger Estermeyer who is professor of international and EU law at King's College London. So we have two speakers from King's College. Um, he's uh, also a research affiliate in the Max Planck Institute, which we'll feature again in a minute. And he's the author, among many other publications, of Human Rights and the WTO, WTO, The Case of Patients and Access to Medications. And I want to thank him for stepping in um, um, instead of Ellen T. Hohen, who sadly had to pull out as a husband passed away. And we do send her our uh, sincere condolences for this loss. And our last speaker will be Professor Ann Peters, who is director of the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law International Law at Heidelberg. And she's a professor at Heidelberg, Berlin, Basel, and Michigan. So I think it's four universities, which is quite a lot. Um, and her current research interests uh, relate to public international law, including global animal law and global constitutionalism. And among her many books and are, is a book on, she, on animals in international law. And she has recently written on the One Health Approach and International Law. So those are our speakers, and I um, 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 think that we will just start now. Uh, and uh, as I said, we'll have uh, 10 minutes uh, for each speaker, so we'll have enough time for um, um, uh, discussion. So uh, Mark, you're welcome to uh, go ahead first. Um, yep, I'm here. OK. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. And it's it's nice to, to come back to speak at, at Tel Aviv again, even if it is if it is virtually. Um, so I think from the outset, I think what I'm going to do is make the case against the treaty or rather present some cautions as to the as to the treaty. And I think that my my concerns around the treaty take two forms, okay? So that there is the, the, the first concern, which I would say is the sort of governance or the structure of the treaty. And the second issue is around the substantive content. And I'll take one each one of those in turn. So I think in the first instance, I think that there are, there are a number of concerns about, as IL set out that the the, um, the introduction there, the timetable for this, this treaty is, is quite unrealistic. We're talking about, Two years from now, this is going to be done, apparently, according to the timetable which was set down through the IMB. 
And I think in the first instance, that is a wholly unrealistic timetable. And I think that unrealistic timetable is being set down by, by um, quite a number of high income countries who are quite keen to seen to be seen as presenting a viable solution to the problems which both they have identified within the pandemic, but which other countries around the world have seen. So I think that there's a little bit of, of, of performative lawmaking almost, that, 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 that this treaty is the solution and we just need to get it done. And I think that's one of the, the, the first issues with it is that actually we're, we're not taking, we're not presenting a realistic time frame here to actually get this done in a, in a meaningful way. But more significantly on the governance point of, of, of this question is the, the fact that we're even going down a treaty approach at all. And I think that there are a number of questions as to what will actually be gained from a treaty, from, from having this as a, as, a, as a treaty under Article 19 of the WHO Constitution. Because as I set out in his introduction, one of the key benefits of, the, of making regulations pursuant to Article 21 of the WHO Constitution is that they take the form of an opt-out system rather than an opt-in through signatory and ratification, as is the traditional way with treaty making. And my big concern in that respect is that we will end up in a fragmented system, or rather we will end up with a further fragmented global health system, because at present the plan is to have to retain the international health regulations and actually reform the international health regulations while simultaneously negotiating this treaty um, and adopting and ratifying this treaty around the world. So you will end up in a situation where some parties, some member states of WHO are signatory to just the international health regulations, and some of them will be a state party to the international health regulations plus, plus the treaty. To further compound this problem, is the fact that the negotiators of the treaty seem to be pushing to adopt in a framework convention approach to, to this new instrument. Now, that makes a lot of sense because WHO has had quite a bit of success with the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. It is the only treaty it, it has negotiated, and it's a form and structure that, that seems to work quite well in, the, in the, the auspices of tobacco control. One of the dangers here is that through a Framework Convention approach where you have a mother, proto a mother treaty and then protocols underneath it, um, which add specificity around, around you know, a, a, pro, a protocol on data sharing, a protocol on equitable access, a, a, a protocol on, on um, pandemic response or whatever, is that you will end up with further fragmentation, particularly as more and more protocols are added to the system. And this is just going to result in a situation where multiple state parties have different obligations during a pandemic. And that is just not a good place to be, particularly when those obligations pertain to things like pathogen sharing, or genetic sequence data sharing from pathogens, or quite importantly, medical countermeasures, uh, the sharing of medical countermeasures. If we end up in a situation where only a small number of countries share and sign up to their to, to a protocol on, on equitable access, we're going to have a wholly disjointed um, system of response. So I think that this treaty could actually further fragment the international system within global health law, and that is an already fragmented system. Now, related to that is um, the, the constitutional limitations of WHO. So bearing in mind the, the um, advisory opinion on, on the use of nuclear weapons in respect of WHO, WHO actually has a very limited role within the eyes of the international community in respect to what does and does not count as human health, which is WHO's remit. So I know that Anne in a little moment is going to speak, be speaking about One Health. But when you look at some of the, the wishes which are being put forward by member states around the world, they want to solve One Health. They want to solve pathogen and data sharing. They want to solve access to medical countermeasures. All of those things are very interdisciplinary. They sit across multiple bodies of international law, multiple bodies of international institutions. You cannot, in my opinion, solve what the One Health problem without engagement with OIE and FAO. You cannot solve equitable access to medicines without joint engagement with the World Trade Organization. You cannot solve data sharing and pathogen sharing without engaging with, with CBD and Nagoya. 
and without having agreements in place with those international institutions. At the moment, this is all being funneled quite directly through the World Health Organization and the World Health Organization alone. And I don't think their constitutional remit allows them to solve these issues in silos. And I think we need to break away from the siloed thinking that we currently have within international law. But at present, there appear to be no proposals in which to do that. Very early on in the proposals for the pandemic treaty, there was some vague mention of this being run through the General Assembly of the United Nations rather than resting with one of the specialized agencies. But since then, we seem to have abandoned that idea altogether. And I don't think WHO can make the meaningful changes it needs to in respect of these multi sectoral issues um, using the current uh, instrument. Those are my issues in respect of sort of treaty design. And, and, and treaty governance, I guess. I'll just move on to the substantive content issues um, with, with the treaty. Now, at present, we have a long list of very vague wishes, which have come out of the Friends of the Treaty um, um, group, and which have come out of the, the European Union um, in particular. But actually, I think we have very little acknowledgement of what went wrong within, um, within with the IHR, and with, with global health law more generally during the COVID pandemic and what we can actually make sub a substantive difference on and what needs to, to actually change with it within global health law. So for instance, the issue of equitable access to vaccines is probably the most glaring, mo mo most glaring problem within global health right now. But when we look at the documents which are which are coming out around the, the negotiations, we have very, very vague references to equity and prioritizing equity and solidarity and very clear, very specific commitments about transfer of, of vaccines, uh, transfer of pathogens and pathogen sequence data from low and middle income countries to high income countries. And one of my concerns is that the, the small number of high income nations who are driving this treaty proposal forward are actually un, are actually unwilling to learn the lessons of what went wrong within with um, with with COVID-19 and in particular are unable to to put those really very have those really very difficult conversations that they need to have with their um with with themselves about how did we end up in a situation where we hoarded all of the vaccines during a pandemic how did we end up in a situation where we got all of the medical countermeasures how do we resolve that issue and I think that the the, the treaty, I think that there are concerns coming out of low and middle income countries, which I, I sympathize with, that actually the, the treaty will just be an extension of the sort of neo-colonialism um, power dynamic, which we see in global health, and will actually further entrench those issues, where it will further entrench the idea that pathogens are no longer sovereign resources of low and middle income countries. Genetic sequence data is not a sovereign resource anymore, and low and middle income countries become obliged to share all of that with high income nations under the auspices or under the language of, 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 of pandemic preparedness and response. And actually there will be very few binding commitments about vaccines returning the other way, about medical countermeasures returning, uh, returning the other way. And I think that's one of the, the real problems or one of the, the real issues I have with the, the pandemic treaty proposals as they currently stand. The other issue I, I just want to touch on for the last minute is that we seem to be sidelining the IHR entirely here. And when you look progressively at the IHR, every IHR review committee, going back to 2009 H1N1, they've all said the, the regulations are not the problem. Implementation is the problem. Compliance is the problem. Um, and even the, the, uh, the, fun the inter independent panel on pandemic preparedness and response said IHR is in the, you know, of the list of 150 recommendations which they gave, all of them could be resolved by amending the IHR or, or further strengthening the obligations which already exist in, under the IHR. The only IPPPR obligation at recommendation which needs a treaty uh, in order to, to meet that recommendation is the recommendation to have a treaty. It's quite self-fulfilling. So I do worry that we're throwing out 150 years of history of in, from the international sanitary regulations through to the IHR that, that have this system of embedding norms um, I do worry that we're sidelining that completely and the real governance win, which we get through through um, the IHR, which is the fact that it's this opt out system rather than this opt in system. So I have, I have real concerns about the treaty being able to solve what it is intended to solve. Um, and I also have real concerns that it's not going to be radical enough in sort of the, the level of proposals which it puts forward to actually solve the problems which we see in, in global health currently. And I'll leave it there.
Thank you. Thank you, Mark, so much. Uh, this is a very fascinating uh, start, and we are going to uh, go now to Nitsin. Um, thank you uh, for uh, uh, invite to this place to share my thoughts, and I would say this itself is one of the uh, ways of uh, decolonizing international law, extending a warm welcome to someone from uh, south of India to address the issue of pandemic preparedness and uh, uh, response. Uh, I have uh, I prepared some, I mean, I'm switching between some of these negotiations happening at the right now at CBD and uh, WHO. So it's, there are some issues with probably with my presentation in terms of orderly presentation. Um, of course, if you would like to uh, turn off the recordings, I could probably uh, come up with some of the comments which is happening in the negotiations. Otherwise, I'm fine. I'm not okay with, uh, I'm mean, fully okay with uh, speaking in terms of uh, in recorded things, but I may, I may cut down uh, points on that's up to you. Um, so I would probably start uh, with my presenting my PPT. Um, um, uh, so slideshow. Okay, sorry. I, I think my screen is clear and uh, yeah. Uh, so to be honest, because I see a lot of friends from Max Planck Institute, uh, you know, the center of jurisprudence, I, I would and myself being, you know, looking at the uh, Indian jurisprudence as you know how, how it could probably contribute to international law. Um, I have few observations, uh, which, which, you know, which may be a little bit jurisprudential rather than, uh, you know, it's, it's slightly important in the sense, like, it's very difficult to uh, understand sometimes what is being asked from or what is being proposed by uh, Southern nations or nations of different culture, uh, which necessarily does not fit into the, the European view of international law or probably the Western view of international law. Uh, this is perhaps, uh, for, for example, you know, uh, I was going through some of the documents in ILC, which clearly, you know, uh, which clearly says it's very difficult for uh, uh, to have a law to, uh, to, 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 to ask for a compile and um, a, a very objective obligation to cooperate with each another. Right. It's, it's probably, uh, you know, you can probably ask uh, countries uh, who refuse the offer of assistance. To provide a reason, uh, but if you cannot ask the countries uh, if they are not responding to the request for assistance, to provide a reason, you know this is how uh, some of the understanding of international law has come up forward. It's it's it has some uh, view of liberal understanding of political values as well because it's you know uh, a few years back uh, I myself had a, you know, a difficulty in understanding uh, when my uh, uh, my, my family has an issue with <laughs> my my marriage, and and I was asking constantly them, how can you uh, force two people to cooperate to live with each other? I mean, it's it's not about my marriage. I mean, uh, something happened behind before my marriage. Uh, you know, it it is you know those societies, those communities with a view that they can force people to cooperate with each other has a different understanding about law, has a different understanding about normative jurisprudence. So they may ask for you know uh, very uh, very strong obligations on uh, sharing, on cooperation, uh, which which is necessarily found as vague, or which is which is not found as you know cannot be translated into the legal language which is existing. This is what this is worrying us a lot. I think it is uh, if we are not able to incorporate those languages, incorporate those understandings uh, of of uh, a non. Uh, uh, I would say non-eurocentric understanding of international law. We, we would probably fail in in terms of developing a new phase of uh, global health law. So uh, going back to the discussions, um, um, you know, uh, Mark Turner came up with a very interesting proposal against or made a, made a case against pandemic treaty preparations. I'm also almost on the same lines, looking at something what we can do uh, before we end up into uh, developing pandemic uh, a new pandemic instrument. Um, I, I don't know how many of you are really uh, aware of uh, IHR in brief. Uh, I, I don't want to get into a lot of details here because my time is limited. But I want to say uh, that IHR is an Article 21 instrument of WHO. 
And it has constantly, as Mark has clearly pointed out, or 150 years, like for example, the entire understanding about sanitary regulations have changed. And once the WHO constitution has been adopted, two times we came up with health regulations. 1952, we came up with the sanitary regulations. 1969, we came up with the first version of IHR. 2005, we came up with the revised situation. We were constantly expanding the kind of you know, uh, ideas and the norms and standards which can go into this instrument. Suddenly, suddenly, post-2005, 2009, we are finding a, 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 a claim from the Western, uh, or, or I would say the rich countries and their companies or their non-state actors, that Article 21 is a very, very, uh, limited in scope. So I have a question, who is actually fearing with Article 21? And you go back to the text of Article 21, you would very clearly understand who fears Article 21. I need not per uh, perhaps explain uh, who is actually against an Article 21 instrument. Now, what IHR in brief, it creates detect, report, access and respond obligations, which as shown in this figure. Uh, I would say, if you look at this, what we think from a, from a perspective of developing country or third world is basically in all the four, we speak about cooperation, okay? We speak about DICTEC, we speak about asking, have a equitable finance and sharing of technology to establish such state of art surveillance systems. We speak about assess, we speak about assessing, working with countries through at WHO, not bilaterally, not multilaterally, not by fragmenting it, at WHO to make decisions. And when we speak about report, we are, we are speaking about reporting not only about the infections, but also about our requirements and the needs and uh, ways to respond to the outbreaks. And, you know, responding to public health events, we want to respond together to public health emergencies. We want to design a way of responding to outbreaks and to, uh, and to see how countries could collaborate in that and what could be the mechanism for that. But if you look at what CDC think, it is only at the assessing point, okay? They speak about uh, a cooperative mentality, working together with countries to uh, make decisions in public health emergencies. And this is a very problematic thing. It is, you know, you could also see the same trend in WGPR and INB negotiations as well. Because, um, uh, um, <clears throat> um, yeah, sorry, uh, uh, because, yeah, I was saying this is because WHO developed a dashboard, which has a collection of uh, recommendations came up from many expert bodies. And this dashboard does not include the recommendations from UN bodies, especially the independent um, expert on uh, international solidarity. And why is the reports or COVID-19 guidance issued by several human rights bodies has not been taken into consideration in the dashboard? I think it is a, a, a view of understanding public health law and emergency from a perspective of prevention, from a perspective of, I mean, I'm not against preventive health, okay? Prevention is better than cure always, but what is it at stake if the prevention fails? If an outbreak happens, just like COVID-19, what we need to do at that point of time? And we pay very, very, very less attention to that aspect. So unless this particular aspect has been reworked, and that too, I would say within IHR, just because uh, nobody else in this world other than Professor Pedro, I think has looked at what is the definition of a pandemic and what would be the scope of a pandemic instrument. Nobody, I've never seen anybody in WGPR or in INB asking this question at any point of time. They've met already more than eight times, but nobody has asked so far, what is the scope of a pandemic? So I'm, I'm not going to get into some of these details where uh, we're looking at, uh, issues of IHR, but I just want to look, show you this. This is how it operates. The IHR is operating like this. An outbreak occurs in a developing country, notifies WHO and other developed countries, this bracket, they say it's legally binding. IHR legally binds to this part of IHR. I mean, this particular obligations. When you move to this side, meaningful assistance and focused collaboration, not guaranteed. Just because a word shall has become should, of course, I'm going against what is the basic principles of law or interpretation. But uh, we need to understand that many countries, many delegates who come to these organizations, to WHO, to negotiate an instrument, 
it's very, very complicated for many of them to understand these, these differences of law, these differences of language. And we are relying on them to develop a, a, an instrument. So it is very important to understand that such, such kind of technicalities or nuances of law may not work in a, in a very uh, in a globalized uh, uh, understand or you know, globalized participation in a treaty making or in the international law making decisions. Uh, you know, it's it's so sad to say that you know uh, there are capacity issues in terms of law making or you know articulating legal provisions or draft or translating demands into law into legal language and putting forward into the negotiating table. So I think if we do not get legal obligations on the second part which is meaningful assistance and focused collaboration. There is not going to be a new phase of global health law, especially addressing to health emergencies or uh, uh, you know, pandemic as such. I give another simple example of how this is functioning because <clears throat> WHO during COVID-19 came up at least 10 times with temporary recommendations, okay? And in the 10 times of recommendations, Director General referred to IHR articles very vaguely, very you know, fragmented times at some point of time. And in fact, Director General was pleading to many of the countries to say, you know, please don't use booster doses or some of these issues. Okay. But there was no strong reference to Article 13, 5, 43, and 44, which speaks about having a coordinated response. So Article 13.5 of IHR very clearly says when WHO requests state parties, even though not infected, should actually, you know, provide support to a to a to a uh, to that particular WHO coordinated activity. Now, if you uh, if you think that World Health Assembly requested uh, Director General to develop a, 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 a COVID tools allocation framework, it was done under the framework of COVAX, and COVAX is not a legal legally binding instrument, I mean, legally binding mechanism. It is a multi-stakeholder mechanism. It should have made under Article 15, made under the IHR framework, and then issued through Article, you know, and, and, w, and the, uh, Director General could have called for uh, cooperating with the facility under Article 13.5, which would have given a more legal force, maybe soft, because the word should appears in Article 13.5, uh, to, 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 to the countries to cooperate with it to countries to provide response to it if they are violating or if they are moving away from that recommendation to provide a reason to the director general and world health organization why they're not doing so. So we could have got a very clearly binding allocation framework with an IHR. Article 43, of course, to, it only speaks about international traffic, but it could be definitely expanded uh, to, to, to stop down the hurdles and access to health, health products. So some of these things which could have been really done by uh, you know, the existing framework was not done. And this was pointed out by IHR Review Committee, but does not propose any specific, you know, concrete suggestions to, to alter this mechanism. So this, that's where we think we need to set it right, either by amending IHR or by bringing in more, you know, uh, WHO resolutions or normative activities through which we can bind or mechanisms through which we can bind, a, a, um, you know, a, a coordinated response to health emergencies. So I think if, if my time is up, I would stop here or uh, yeah, if there are more time, up, I would So just... uh, if you want to say yeah. a concluding uh, sentence, it's pretty hard, it's up, yeah. Yeah, okay. So the last sentence, which I would probably say is one more interesting feature with regard to, uh, uh, with regard to the, um, the ongoing process, because actually there are call for legal reforms at WHO as divided into two, that is WGPR and INB. Uh, and the United States have actually come up with a proposal for amending IHR. There are at least 13 articles United, United States is promoting to amend IHR. And none of these articles is actually speaking about designing uh, a, a, an internationally coordinated response mechanism to health emergency outbreaks. It's not speaking about equity, even when EB 150 uh, decides or clearly has a decision that IHR amendments should address equity, it has not uh, taken into consideration. Now, if US gets through the proposal of all the amendments which they have proposed, which is very unlikely, but if they get it, I'm almost sure that 
uh, a new pandemic instrument would not be of uh, much appetite to any of the developed countries. So developing countries would be back without uh, uh, much, help, much help and assistance. So uh, it could even uh, frustrate the entire process of uh, INB negotiations. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. And we are now uh, going uh, to Holger. Okay. First of all, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. Can you hear me? Eyal is looking very irritated. Ah, no, great. No, no, no. Thanks. I... <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, even though I'm replacing Ellen, who we all acknowledge would be far better placed to speak on the topic but I'm gonna do my very best. And it's a rather complex topic. And I'm gonna pick up some of the themes that Nihin uh, talked about, uh, in particular capacity issues. Also prepared a PowerPoint and let me see whether I'm technologically challenged here. Let's try this. Can you see the PowerPoint as well? Silence now. You ah, can no. see the PowerPoint, yeah. Yes, Excellent. yes. So the, uh, the task that I have is to speak about IP in the context of a new pandemic treaty and uh, why is IP even relevant for a pandemic treaty? This is from the decision to establish the intergovernmental negotiating body to strengthen pandemic prevention. Uh, and it states acknowledging the need to address gaps in preventing, preparing for and responding to health emergencies including in development and distribution of an unhindered timely and equitable access to medical countermeasures, such as vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. The issue of equitable access to pharmaceuticals and IP law has been an issue that has been gnawing away at the international community in different fora now over decades. Uh, first of all, the reality of equitable access, this is COVID vaccine doses administered, and I think I downloaded it just before the lecture, so this is current, and you can see that equality is far from what we have. You can see that in particular, Africa simply lacks access to medication. And you can see that that's even true for South Africa, a country that actually has manufacturing capacities in the field. Now, why is IP law relevant? And what is IP law good for anyway? IP law is generally intellectual property. The idea that you should grant property rights in areas of intellectual knowledge. So patents for inventions, copyrights for creative works you came up with, trademarks, as signifies who produced a product. We will focus on patent. The basic idea of patent is, if you invent some new technology that is non-obvious, you can disclose what you've just invented and you will get rights to exclude others from making, producing and selling the thing for a limited amount of time, 20 years since filing. The idea behind patents is that if you invent something new, it takes time and money. But when you bring it to the market, others can often just copy it. So you've invested in research, but you bring it to the market, other will, others will copy it and haven't invested in the research and they will undercut you. So nobody will do the research anymore. That is the idea behind patents. We hence grant rights to exclude others. We grant quasi-monopolies on what you've invented as an incentive to create new things. Now, there are all sorts of empirical problems with that statement, because first of all, humans create things not just because of these incentives, but also for other incentives. Uh, there is very little convincing empirical data on what this means for how long patents should be, for example. Should they be 20 years? Should they be 15 years? Should they be 10 years? Should they be the same for all industry? But the reality is we have patent laws now. Now, patent laws are territorial in nature. So if you get a patent in the United States, 
It's only valid in the United States if you have a patent in India. It's only valid in and for India. And that created, at least from the point of view of the developed world, created a problem because that meant that the developed world had to grant all of the incentives for creation and then could be undercut. And the idea was we need globally similar rights. So what then happened was a push to quasi-harmonize international patent law. And that led to patent law being included in a number of fora. And that brings me to this slide. Originally, we do have the World Intellectual Property Organization as a forum to negotiate IP treaties. But when you negotiate IP in the World Intellectual Property Organization, you cannot offer countries anything to introduce patent rights that they don't want to introduce in their national law. So developed countries moved the negotiations to the World Trade Organizations where you could make offers in trade and agricultural products, for example. And in 1994, the agreement on trade-related aspects of IP rights was concluded in the context of the World Trade Organization forcing WTO members to basically have a roughly harmonized patent law as minimum approaches to patent law. Countries were still allowed to negotiate even higher standards in free trade agreements, which then happened as well. Now, there are all sorts of problems we have with this intellectual property order, because the first thing that I need to say for pharmaceuticals, and that's rather vital, is that we often imagine, well, you invent a new drug, you get a patent, and that's the patent for the pharmaceutical. That is what allows you to produce it. So either you get a license and you can then produce it under license, or you don't and you can't produce it. The reality is that knowledge is developed incrementally, and every step leads to new patents, for example, by universities, for example, by uh, companies. And so when you look at mRNA, the new vaccine developments, for example, the innovative companies often have 20 patents. And nobody quite knows which of these patents are really necessary to produce the product. And the idea that society gave a patent for disclosing the invention, which would enable others to produce the invention, also fails because you now have a patent made. And even someone who's read all of the, these patent disclosures doesn't necessarily have the capacity to then set up a company and produce that pharmaceutical because there might still be aspects of the knowledge that are actually secret. So you can see we have created a very, very complex maze here. The question now is, what is the impact of patents on access to medicines? And the reality is patents allow others, uh, allow the, the innovator to exclude others from making the product. So they create they limit the market. They're not necessarily always monopolies because sometimes the patent is not necessary to produce that specific pharmaceutical, but they at least make it more difficult. That means the patent holder can get, a, get higher prices, which is actually one of the ideas of patents because we wanted innovation to be worthwhile. So the patent holder gets higher prices, which of course means the product costs more. And developing countries, if it's a global company that has patented the product in all countries, developing countries often do not really command any company within their territory that can produce the same product. That is a problem for countries like Botswana, for example, that doesn't have manufacturing capacity. So they really don't have anyone at their disposal who could produce the product, even absent a patent in their territory. So the question now is, what can we do about this? And here we get to the problem that Nithin has identified, a lack of capacity. We have negotiations on access to medicines and patents at a large scale in the World Trade Organization. Uh, India and South Africa have demanded a waiver of patent rights for the pandemic, and negotiations about that have been ongoing for a while. So if we now start negotiations in the WHO about patents, can we add anything to that? 
some would say we need those negotiations in the WHO because in the World Trade Organization, the perspective of the negotiators is a trade-based one, a maximization business perspective, which usually is more patent friendly. If we now negotiate the same topic in the WHO, it will be a health-based perspective. So it will be critical of patents where they actually hinder access. But the problem there is to coordinate those two negotiation processes. And the reality is that for many countries, the WTO negotiations will take precedence. So uh, while some scholars have recommended to actually negotiate new flexibilities into patent law through the WHO, I think this is not a very promising outlook because coordinating the two negotiation processes will be very difficult for all but the most developed countries and accordingly offers little prospect of succeeding. But that doesn't mean uh, that there is no space for meaningful negotiation in the, the World Health Organization, because one of the problems is there's a gap between international patent law and national patent law. And now this is a little bit complex and I'm just gonna show you the complexity here. International patent law allows for compulsory licenses. That is a state says, you know what, the monopoly holder, the patent holder, doesn't allow me to get the pharmaceutical in sufficient quantity and at the right price. I need a compulsory license. I will allow others to manufacture the product and to some extent expropriate. It's not technically an expropriation, but to some extent limit the patent rights. The TRIPS agreement has imposed conditions on that. These are the conditions. I don't want to torture you with that. I basically show them so that you can see it has imposed quite a lot, of a lot of conditions. In the past, these were already contentious because one of the conditions is that a compulsory license must be granted for use within your territory mainly, which meant that India, when it grants a compulsory license, can only grant that compulsory license to give the medication to Indian patients, not to a country in Africa that doesn't have production capacity but really needs access to the medication. So the reform process was put in place and an amendment to the TRIPS agreement was negotiated. Again, with very complicated conditions. Now, just a couple of days ago, South Africa, India, the US and the EU agreed on additional flexibilities in the context of the TRIPS agreement which would waive some of these conditions. Now that's not yet through the WTO, this is just the main stakeholders and all members in the WTO need to agree. But there's a problem with it. These are flexibilities in your international obligations. The problem is countries now need to implement them in their national laws. If they don't do that, the flexibilities in the international system that would allow you to grant compulsory licenses for other countries are entirely meaningless because what determines for the national producer whether it will infringe a patent or not is national patent law. So one of the spaces that there is for a WHO negotiation in this area is to force countries to implement flexibilities in their national legislation, allowing compulsory licenses for export, allowing, if these get to the WTO, additional flexibilities in this field. This would not conflict at all with negotiations in the World Trade Organization, but it would actually make them more effective because exceptions negotiated there would then become mandatory for national patent law through the work in the WHO. It would not reproduce any negotiation processes. It would, if you want, benefit from the negotiations in the WTO, and it would lead to synergy. In addition, one could think of the nexus between drug approval and patent law, which creates additional complexities, but I don't want to bother you with that because I'm at the limit of my time and I fear I have tortured you enough with IP law in the, in the short time span. I know this is very, very demanding and there's, like a, there's a high threshold to understanding the topic of IP and patent to, uh, and access to medicines because you have so many orders intermingling plus the factual realities of patenting. But thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss possibilities of what can be done 
in a new pandemic treaty. Thank you very much, Olga. Thank you. And we go now to our last speaker before uh, uh, discussion, which is uh, Anne. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me and can you also see my slides? Yeah, we can. Yes. Okay, maybe they're not in the presentation mode, but that should not bother you, I hope. Uh, yes, um, the initiative uh, taken by the 25 heads of states for the pandemic treaty uh, explicitly mentions One Health. So during the World Health Assembly special sessions, New Zealand and the European Union and the Group of Friends and a number of mainly European states, but also India, Lebanon, Mexico and Morocco, they requested the inclusion of One Health provisions in this projected treaty. And um, I would now like to critically analyze this idea. You see here One Health visualized with the three overlapping circles that human health, animal health and planet's health is intersecting. And One Health has been defined in a publication of UNEP of the United Nations Environmental Program 2020 as, I quote, the collaborative effort across multiple disciplines to attain optimal health for people, animals, and the environment. It has emerged as a key tool for preventing and managing diseases occurring at the interface of human, animal, and environment health, end of quote, of UNEP. And the background is that three quarters of all emerging infections, diseases originate in animals. The interface of human and animal disease has been dramatically brought to the fore by COVID-19. Less well known than the bats are the minks. In the Netherlands and in Denmark, there was a human mink contamination with COVID and this led to the culling of in total 23 million minks. And the episode sped up the phasing out of the mink farms in the Netherlands. Uh, but in Denmark, which has an even bigger mink industry with 17 million mink pelts per year, the animals were killed in the fall, but the business has not been closed. Yeah, and I think, uh, yeah, this uh, is quite a horrible example of reactions to uh, zoonosis, I think. Did you want it to move to the second slide? You should put the emphasis on it because we see the first one in big. Yeah, well, this is, so you see the minks now or not? Uh, no, we see them on the side in small, but not as the main slide. Yeah, that is a problem then. So I'm not connected, yeah. Um, we can, uh, yeah. do you want me to try and share them? Yes, Maybe please. Why don't you do that? Okay. So I'll do, okay. I'll stop now. Okay, you, you continue talking and see. Yeah, I don't mm -hmm. know if it will work well, but we'll try that. Okay. Yeah, because I, I, I would try in a minute. It yeah, will... try, because yeah, I yeah. think uh, the mink picture is quite <laughs> nice. Uh, so actually, the One Health paradigm came up in the aftermath of um, the 2003 um, severe acute respiratory syndrome, which is also a zoonotic disease transmitted from bats. And it was the word was first used by an NGO in 2004 and then by... Uh, by international organizations in 2008. And the fields of application of the One Health paradigm so far have been, yes, thank uh, you for the slides. And now why don't you go to the minks so that you see the minks. Yeah, the minks. Okay. Yeah. Um, and now, thank you going for the, to the third one. <laughs> okay. uh, so this is now again about the substance and field of application of One Health. Um, it has been applied to wildlife conservation and most prominently to combating antimicrobic resistance, AMR. For example, the Dutch government in 2009 decided to take strict measures to reduce the use of antibiotics in animals due to concerns for public health. And these actions were framed as a One Health policy and included strengthening the role of veterinarians, taking measures to improve animal health, and promoting the prudent use of antibiotics in line with official reduction targets. And this led to a 64% reduction of antibiotics in animals in the Netherlands on the basis of this One Health policy. So now what can One Health mean at all? And we are still it's fine with this slide. So first we have the term health. And as you know, health 
with regard to human health, the concept has evolved from the absence of disease or infirmity more in the direction of a positive concept, including the ability to adapt and to self-manage in the face of social, physical, and emotional challenges. And this concept of health is in flux. I think that this, a similar expansion should be done with regard to animal health, should also not only be regarded as the absence of disease, but as a positive capability to flourish. And environmental health would then also include a capacity to regenerate. And the second element of the one health is, of course, the one. Uh, uh, here I put some thoughts on the slide. One means unity and interdependence. It means that the health of one of the three components cannot be achieved without the health of the other components. But secondly, the one also means that we have only one single health and that there is no other second. There is also no other second planet. And uh, the term one was modeled on the term one world, which alludes exactly to that and also to the interdependence of North and South. So the one health approach signals a commitment to work collectively towards a shared goal, such as combating the virus, stopping encroachment of wildlife habitat and high density farming. And it all also signifies a commitment to work collectively towards shared benefits like the vaccine on which Holger spoke. So let's go to the next slide, Ayan, please. The, the concept of One Health has been used as a collaboration framework for numerous international organizations. Um, there has been also a One health high-level panel established in a collaboration of the th four international organizations. One of them, the, which you maybe don't know so well, is the Organisation Internationale des Épisodies, the Animal World Health Organization. Um, and I put a picture of, which I took myself, in the hall of this organization, which has its seat in Paris, which is also involved in this collaboration. The panel, which was uh, founded in 2021, um, is supposed to advise these four organizations and to develop a long-term global plan of action to advert outbreaks of zoonotic diseases. And it has so far established four working groups, one on health implementation, one on an inventory of current knowledge in preventing emerging zoonosis, one on surveillance, and the fourth group on the factors causing the spillover and the subsequent spread of zoonotic diseases. Now, question, what is the legal status of One Health? Um, I think, uh, Ayl, maybe you can go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so of course, One Health is itself not a legal pr principle, but it is related to the no harm principle, which has a customary law status. And it's also related to the legal or at least quasi legal principle of solidarity. Solidarity is also mentioned in both COVID related resolutions of the United Nations General Assembly of 2029. Uh, one. So if One Health were now enshrined in the new treaty, should it come about, it would acquire the status of a treaty principle. And now my question, and I put again some words on the slide, which would be the legal consequences or legal repercussions that a One Health approach could have. Roughly speaking, a One Health approach is supposed to be a tool for making visible and for filling up the blind spot created by the institutional and normative fragmentation. This is exactly what also Mark Eccleston mentioned at the beginning. We have a fragmentation between different organizations. Holger also mentioned it. The WHO and the International Health Regulations focus on health. The FAO focuses on food. The CITES focuses on trade and animals and so on. And the relevant activities have to be coordinated. The gaps have to be filled. And to that end, a One Health approach would form a legal basis for the cooperation of international organizations and programs which pursue their mandates in one of the three sectors, human, animal, planet. Um, and 
Juan Health, recognized as a legal principle, would then also forestall any legal reproach of unlawful mission creep and ultra-virus action of the collaborating international organizations. And here I hook on to the first presentation by Mark. He was, uh, he mentioned, pointed out correctly, that uh, the WHO only has a limited mandate. It is not allowed to step beyond the mandate of the constituent treaty. If a One Health principle were legalized, then this would, I think, provide an argument, quite a convincing argument, for a lawful extension of uh, the mandate of the WHO, but also of the other ones. Of course, follow-up questions would still remain. How to deal with diverging sets of membership, how to deal, how to allocate resources and costs among the collaborating organizations. So the principle as such does not resolve these problems, of course. One Health would demand a systemic interpretation of the relevant legal instruments, such as CITES Convention, uh, CITES Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species, Convention on Migratory Species, Convention on Biodiversity, Paris Agreement on Climate, TRIPS, as mentioned by Holger, and so on, in order to harmonize their content, such as systemic, mutually harmonizing interpretation is warranted. That is also prescribed in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties itself. You could say, well, it's not necessary to have a One Health approach to also mandate that. But this integrationist and harmonizing approach would not only apply to treaty interpretation, but it would also apply to the operationalization of all other types of legal instruments, such as the international health regulations, also the SDGs, um, the sustainable development goals, and risk assessment procedures. And One Health would mandate, or would at least encourage, the reconciliation of conflicting and antagonist goals, similar to the principle of sustainable development. That means that the inevitable trade-offs should never be done completely at the expense of one goal to the other. For example, if there is a conflict between an environmentalist objective and a human development project, then the human development project may not be pursued to an extent that harms to the environment are disproportionate. I think that would be a consequence of the One Health approach. Now, Aya, let's go to the next slide to the critique of this pro proposed principle. So first, it may be superfluous because we already have similar principles such as sustainable development, which also mandates such an integrationist and reconciliatory approach. However, I think One Health is not redundant because it focuses specifically on health. Second, the term is, of course, a very vague slogan only. The vagueness can lead to emptiness, but the vagueness is also a strength. As we know, the term has a constructive ambiguity inherent in it. It conveys a broader appeal for coalition builders, which have various um, ideas in mind and uh, interpret the concept uh, slightly differently. So it can function as a bridge. However, many operationalizations of One Health lack a social ambition. And I think that the this social dimension, with which I also mean a north-south dimension, is a bit underdeveloped and should be strengthened. I hope this can speaks to our third speaker, Nifi. This should be put to the forefront. And this would then also mean that the One Health expertise must not only comprise human doctors and veterinarians and environmentalists, but also social scientists, economists, and lawyers. Final point of critique, One Health is predominantly understood in an anthropocentric way. In its current understanding and application, the health of the animals and the health of the planet are purely instrumental for achieving human health as the superior goal. The debate about this veiled anthropocentrism is of course familiar from environmental law, including international environmental law. 
Many radical environmentalists claim that the current legal approaches are not ecocentric and rather ask for a more for a deep environmentalism, earth jurisprudence, and similar approaches. I would submit that an anthropocentric model of One Health is not really One Health at all, but is simply a hijacking of the term that deprives all parties of the benefits. With the three concentric circles, One Health, I think, must have the meaning that it is not hierarchical, but that animal health and nature's health must be considered on the same footing as animal as human health. And this then would demand to take livestock more decisively into the purview of One Health methods and not only livestock. Yes, uh, Eyal, you may well very well go to the last slide. So One Health guided policies um, to reduce the risk of a spillover of pathogens from animals to humans, to reduce zoonosis would include also, the reduction of stocking density for farm animals would mandate the reduction of antibiotics, would mandate licensing and a much better supervision of animal transports, and would also call for the reduction of unsustainable consumption, notably beef. So ultimately, if one health is taken seriously, this would have to overcome the legal hierarchy between humans on the one side and animals and the planet on the other side and would suggest to acknowledge a legal personality of natural entities, as it is done now in case law of many states, for, or some states, for example, India, and personality of animals. Ultimately, One Health needs to be further complemented by One Welfare and One Rights. And this should lead also to a reconsideration of the mink business and end it once and for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you all. Uh, very fascinating. And we don't have a lot of time. So I just want to say that one sentence in my role as a chair and discussant and then take questions. Um, I, I think that uh, we have a very interesting perspective. And, and, and I think that a lot of them dealt with the question of, you know, what are the problems that we have now and whether a pandemic treaty can solve them. And, and uh, for me, one question to remains with, and it has to do going back to what we started with Mark, which said that the problem, according to the different reports, is that the international health regulations are not implemented and the problems are not in the health regulation. But I wonder also what problem we do have in the health regulation, which are not addressed. And I think this came up in some of the other three talks. Uh, and of course, Mark would probably say, don't expect that a treaty can cover those issues. And moreover, it will be ultra virus uh, authority or the capacity of the WHO to cover those issues of uh, IP, animal health, etc. But one thing that I also keep thinking, because uh, uh, in, at least in my reading, and I, I, I'm thinking here of also Andrew Lakoff's idea of uh, contrasting the what he called two regime of, of, of global health, the humanitarian biomedicine, model versus the global health security model. And the international health regulation, um, while they do embody the concept of human rights and, uh, and, and a freedom of trade and travel, as we've seen, and I think it came up very much in Nissin's presentation, very much focused on the security and the surveillance, less on what do we do later and how do we cooperate and what do we do later. But moreover, also, um, to what extent, and I think that's something that I, 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 maybe we can, can come up with the discussion, although we don't have a lot of time, to some extent, the definition in the International Health Regulation of um, that it mostly is interested what can be defined as a public health emergency in financial concern are extraordinary events posing a, health, a public health risk to other countries through international spread. To what extent does that exclude from our purview uh, endemic diseases, non-communicable diseases, uh, and to what extent, you know, can we address the double burden of diseases in, of, in, in low and middle in income countries? And to what extent uh, can a pandemic treaty, you know, even if it attempts to improve in the international health regulation, remains in prioritizing um, a certain unidirectional spread of disease from the global south to the global north, which is considered a, no a threat to the global north, uh, and then we get triggered, and not when there are millions of people dying from endemic diseases, which are mostly in the global south, from non-communicable diseases, which everyone suffers from, but we know there's a uh, growing, uh, yeah. So I think that's, that's, that's something that not clear to me whether a pandemic treaty will be able to overcome this bias, if you want to call it this way, or whether that's 
not even something that is even considered. And I think when we talk about, uh, you know, overcoming the IP issues, overcoming the, uh, what Anne talked about, uh, both animal welfare, but as a human welfare of everyone, and the issues of Nissin talk about what 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 does that you know what does that bring for for uh, low and middle income countries? I think that's kind of uh, for me a very pertinent question. But if it's okay with the speakers, I would like them because we have very short time to keep in mind this question. Maybe other question. Maybe we can collect a few questions and then we'll do a, a round. So please write down. So I think at this stage, anyone that wants to raise a question or say something, uh, uh, we'll raise a hand. You, it's best that you re use a raise a hand. Uh, um, um, option in Zoom, and as usual, we'll try and give priority to our students, but everyone is welcome to uh, raise a hand. I don't see anyone yet, so I'm looking for the first one, and uh, don't be ashamed to be the first one um, to raise a hand, and, and any questions, thoughts, uh, or comments that you may have following this uh, fascinating discussion. Um, am I? Oh, yeah. So, Yael, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. I hope you can uh, hear me well because I can't. Uh, I can hear everyone, but I can't see anyone. We so can, can hear you well can... and see you. Black screen. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, more about the uh, the article of uh, Professor Peters, um, also about the whole solidarity solidarity um, principle, and also about uh, the call uh, so some kind of a call for action. I think I read it like this uh, for academia to. Uh, to take in in their hands uh, like what we should do because uh, in the end of the paper uh, they said uh, uh, making those arguments that uh, all human health will be uh, will be better if we take in, in uh, we take care also of uh, animal health is the responsibility of uh, Marie and her colleagues to make uh, these arguments so I was asking if uh, if you see the responsibility more of uh, like top down governments need to take the action and see this is right and, and do something this is more something like uh, from down up uh, all the society needs to to understand this and uh, like take show that they need it like through some kind of a protest like uh, like the human uh, like the environmental uh, protests that are going on for a really long time and then something will do, do or, or it, it's not about uh, that and the other question i had is more about the solidarity principle because um I find myself not really, maybe it's not very optimistic, but I find this that the solidarity uh, principle is only theoretical, but we see that uh, countries are not really, maybe willing, but not really willing to do something uh, um, between themselves when it comes to solidarity. But if we take another turn, like if we um, explain everything not through a solidarity principle, like we need to be with solidarity to everyone around us, all the countries or, or the economical uh, statues, but this is purely economical. Like if we don't do this right, then there are going to be more pandemics and then our uh, economical systems are going to, uh, to, um, to uh, be less, less good because of it and we're going to uh, less money or something, uh, less jobs. Um, and if we do take care of this uh, through COVAX, for example, uh, which will make less pandemics, uh, last uh, less time worldwide, then our economical systems will be better, and at the end, more money is going to come. So I find that this is uh, this is maybe uh, something that can be better because solidarity. We can see that uh, even the, on the environmental side, um, doesn't really uh, work that well. Thank you. Uh, maybe we'll take one more question and then we can, uh, yeah, is that okay? We collect the question, okay? So um, uh, with that, you have the next one. Um, first of all, thank you. It has been very interesting. Thank you for your time. Um, my question, since the topic has been raised, my I also um, wanted to say something regarding the solidarity principle. Um, this is also directed to Professor Peters. Um, so actually, I think maybe it's it's a similar point, but from a different point of view. Um, so I think that the, like what I thought re when I when I uh, um, when I uh, read the, the 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 everything regarding the solidarity principle was that um, I think that 
um, actually the legal arguments can be wider and maybe uh, stronger and actually emphasize more the, 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 the obligation that we the, that the countries have and that the global south has regard uh, uh, to uh, the global north has uh, to the global south and when we when since we said that in in global in the one health approach we stress that the, the health of humans uh, is connected to the health of the environment and to health the, to the health of of animals, the same can be said regarding humans themselves. So the health of all humans is connected to the health of all humans. And we saw that um, in the in the COVID pandemic, when we saw that uh, all variations of uh, the virus were getting to all countries because we, we couldn't uh, um, uh, vaccinate uh, all of the countries. So we saw how uh, in the end, uh, all, all the health of all uh, uh, of all humans is connected. So I thought that maybe it could be uh, it could be we could use a strong we could use stronger language and make it seem like it's an obligation. And so we don't uh, get to to the point where the global uh, south has to plead to the no global north to help it, and then the global north has to thank the global south. And if I, I think that. Uh, um, if we, we, we when we frame when we have when we frame uh when we frame this as an obligation uh then um it would it, it, it would be like um it more con more stronger <laughs> okay uh thank you and now uh basil thank you this is uh, regarding uh professor peter's uh article so I'm, i want to say like uh, the one health approach as i understand it stands against uh, uh, voluntarism which is a gatekeeper rule uh, in international law so first of all we have we should uh, require state consent for uh, such a approach to to occur in uh, real time and uh, secondly though i think uh, solidarity is a, a crucial part in international law but uh, i don't really think it is the center of all the good things that we expect from countries to, to do uh, and that's it uh, thank you very much And now Pedro. Yes, thanks so much to everyone. So I realize Professor Petters already has several questions. Yes, to add one brief question to that uh, list. Um, so in your view, Professor Petters, uh, you know, One Health as it's currently framed is still anthropocentric and that is you know, not desirable. But would you say then that, you know, being able to reach a point of compromise where even though you know the ultimate goal is still to benefit humans, um, but what if you know we can somehow reach the realization that benefiting humans can only be possible by also respecting the other, taking those other dimensions seriously, right? Because as long as so, it's a virtuous circle. As long as we uh, do not address environmental health and animal health properly, we will continue to experience these pandemics. So ultimately, so I realize this is, um, you know, which will, uh, I realize this may undermine, right, the goal of taking One Health seriously, but on the other hand, it may lead to positive spillover. So would you see this compromise as, as uh, something that at least would contribute to a better welfare for the environment and animal health? And I, just two brief questions, if I may not to abuse, but uh, going back to the go idea ahead. of solidarity, which... Uh, yeah, please go ahead, yeah. Thank you. With the idea of solidarity, which was already uh, touched upon by uh, Yael and Basil, I believe. Um, so, and back, all the way back to Mark Eccleston Turner's and uh, Nathan's uh, presentation, uh, and particularly in Mark's uh, very valid points and warnings about the pandemic treaty, uh, and allow me to be a bit polemical here and shining, uh, shedding more light on Holger's a map on what vaccine inequality looks like. And if we go back to the beginning, so the, the high income countries were, of course, speeding up and doing their best to secure vaccines for their own populations. 
And I realized I'm speaking in a forum in Israel, which was one of the countries who did this the fastest, right? And so a question for both Mark and Nitin, can you imagine how the difficulties in a scenario where in the in future obligations, if the result of those obligations would be that these countries that secured vaccines the fastest might be actually tying their hands in the future for the sake of other countries. What do you think? Uh, don't you think this might pit, you know, the negotiators against their domestic constituencies and say, hey, you know, you're limiting our capacity to be protected in the future for the sake of this, um, you know, this idea of solidarity. Do you see this as a key challenge or maybe I'm... Uh, Maybe there would be a way to still maintain this uh, idea without uh, making uh, negotiators nervous about what their domestic constituencies may say. And one point, one point uh, briefly to Holger uh, Hestemeyer. Um, uh, so thanks, and I, I do see your point that you know mo many of the issues can be addressed currently with the trips flexibilities. However, you know remembering uh, also one of uh, or several actually publications by Ellen Tuhun on, well, what about the sharing of, the active sharing of know-how, right? And technology transfer as a legal matter uh, rather than only a voluntary issue as it currently is. Do you see any future, any potential for this to become, uh, let's say more entrenched in international settings or is it really, are we stuck with this full, legally voluntary uh, participation by either private companies or other governments who really give the technology and the know-how to the country, to other countries to expand capacity. Thanks everyone for a fascinating discussion. Thanks. I think we have one more question, but we just have seven more minutes. So I think that we may have to, uh, yeah, unless you can say it in one sentence very quickly, but really one sentence. It's a really short sentence. Like it's just a follow-up to something I had uh, regarding a uh, professor Peter's article, which I found really interesting. Just the really question is how you think the, um, is the welfare aspect of the One Health um, um, uh, approach um, intrinsic to it? Because how, how does that work with this like current global cap capitalist uh, economy? Or is it something that must be part of this approach or uh, can we put that aside? That's all. Thanks. Uh, okay. Uh, unfortunately, we can't take more questions. I'm sorry, because we have five minutes. If we will spill over to use the term in five minutes. That's okay, of course, everyone that wants to live and especially our students at 5.45 precisely uh, can do so. Uh, so let's, maybe we go now in, in reverse order and, and, and I'd ask you to answer as briefly as possible. Uh, so uh, Professor Ann Peters, please, you go first. I know you had many questions to you, so you tried and you can try now, yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Do you hear me? Um, yeah, we hear you well. Okay, I will uh, try to, uh, answer an, in an analytic way. So solidarity as a legal principle, I think that it is uh, necessary to strengthen this again to complement our current, as it was also said, capitalist, liberal, and even neoliberal order, order in order to infuse the social element back into this order. And historically, if you read, for example, the United Nations Charter, the term social, social development, the institution, economic and social council as a body of the United Nations is much more prominent, for example, human rights. However, of course, a broad principle cannot lead to a proper implementation. And historically, this idea of development had been approached in a very paternalist way. But I think that we are now at the turning point seeing what ruthless capitalism, destruction of the planet and so on is doing, uh, that we have to reactivate this, uh, this um, tradition of solidarity, but only as a complement, not as doing away, I think, uh, uh, with uh, liberal features, notably human rights protection. And um, this idea of solidarity as I mentioned in the paper, um, is part of the constitutional heritage in many countries and also in the European Union, for example. There is a recent decision by the European Court of Justice concerning EU law now, but I, I, it's new, I didn't mention it in the paper yet, where the court clearly says in the field of energy law that there is a constitutional principle of solidarity and therefore that 
uh, Germany wasn't allowed to do something with regard to uh, energy uh, against Poland. And the solidarity principle was the key argument. So of course, all depends on, uh, on the operationalization, making it concrete in different fields such as health law. Now, a final point of what Yael and others mentioned, the question of how to bring about legal change. Of course, it must be both bottom up and top down. In democratic states, civil societies, and also in less democratic states, civil society action will be uh, one factor in pushing governments to move uh, with lawmaking also on the international plane. Uh, but in the end, the states and the governments are in the driving seat. Huh? Um, and I also think that legal development, although in our capitalist world, the economic factors, the profit thinking is dominant. Uh, I think that legal change has come about and can come about on the basis of, a, of interests, selfish interests, but also on the basis of ideals. Uh, there are famous examples like the abolishment of slavery that was not only done because it was economically profitable, although there has been such a debate, it was done also because people uh, thought uh, that the slave trade was ir Im immoral. And I think that it's good to push on all fronts uh, to motivate uh, egoism, such as concerns for one own health, concerns for one own profit, but also uh, appeal to uh, altruistic um, uh, things. That's it. Thank you. And Holger, you are next. Thank you. Um, quick answer to Pedro. Yeah, I think there is some space. Um, I, I feel the problem is that we have locked ourselves into ever higher standards of IP law. Uh, there's a famous book by Lauren Klessig who said, quick advice to new movie makers, um, only make a movie of naked people who are standing in a room without anything in, in it and don't say anything because anything else will get you into lawsuits. And, and I fear that's also true for patents. There's ever higher standards and ever more agreements and the system is at risk of not working the way it is intended. So we need fundamental reform. And uh, given the multitude of treaties we have, that's getting ever harder. But I feel there are gaps in sort of, also in sharing, uh, as Ellen wrote, but I think also in structuring national IP laws that can be usefully regulated. Um, and that brings me to the, to the initial uh, comment that Eyal made, uh, and in fact, the principle of solidarity you asked whether the pandemic treaty can also do something uh, for lower and middle income treaty countries or whether this is targeted mostly at the interest of the rich. Uh, and I fear that while this pandemic um, clearly was harder on the richer countries to some extent because the, the, the younger populations were less affected, the pandemic touched all and the principle of solidarity, a, a little bit cynical here, works best when there's a bit of egotistical interest in it. So the fact that you feel you're affected for pandemics might make the rich compromise more than they would if they felt this has nothing to do with us. This is only about solidarity. It's all solidarity. So solidarity will work, but it will work even better when there's a bit of self-interest. And that is the case with pandemics. So I feel we can uh, get a precedent here that might then entrench more solidarity. Thank you, and we go to Nissen. Thank you for the questions. So uh, the question which was directed to me, which is directly on uh, how uh, are legally binding obligations on uh, perhaps an allocation framework would be challenging in negotiations. I think that's the, that's, that is one of the, uh, uh, points which may have a very less uh, challenge in terms of, uh, uh, if at all, and of course, it is very difficult to convince the developed countries that we need a legally binding allocation framework. But once uh, that kind of a negotiation or that kind of a text is put into the table, I think it's something which is not very, uh, for example, if you model it this way, that uh, the WHO has developed a COVAX uh, framework for vaccines at the moment. Now uh, that speaks about a plan. To so, if we if we frame a law which says that uh, countries acting or unilaterally taking measures or or doing advanced purchase agreements should not 
you know, should not um, create obstacle or create a hurdle to the WHO allocation plan. You know, that that could be a very uh, acceptable uh, norm, which could be probably easily negotiated. I'm not really sure about it. I'm just uh, thinking that you know this could be something which I mean because the quantity could be probably a little less than. Uh, what what needs to be uh, shared out because the other arguments you know other larger equity uh, uh, requirements such as uh, behavior of intellectual property rights and sharing of technologies i think more more difficult because of the uh, presence of uh, private sector influence of private sector so this would be more i think uh, government to government negotiation where we could probably have some uh, positive answers. I uh, just uh, stop with quickly saying two comments on um, uh, One Health and Solidarity, as well as one question put on uh, put by Axel. On One Health, the one point which I find very, very difficult about One Health is, One Health is constantly frustrating uh, obligations of Nagoya Protocol. It is, I know it is actually going through a lot of uh, platforms, including FAO, OIE, CBD, and many other uh, 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 platforms. It is pushing hard without uh, the definition seems to be adopted by the secretariats of these organizations. Member states have not scrutinized it. And the, and the One Health approach does not even speak about health inequities existing in uh, you know, different countries. So it is, it is this particular approach, if it is mainstreamed and fast-tracked, is going to frustrate obligations of Nagoya Protocol, which is a main negotiating uh, you know, uh, in, uh, aspect in terms of when we look at pandemic treaty or, uh, uh, or IHR amendments. Uh, then on solidarity, it is more important that we translate solidarity and equity into legal commitments. Uh, and last one, Mark. Okay, so I will I will make this this really quick. Um, Pedro, negotiators in Geneva should be nervous. Our negotiators should be thoroughly ashamed of how our governments have behaved over the past eighteen months, and they should uh, they should expect repercussions for doing so. You know the 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 way in which high income nations have engaged in in vaccine nationalism and hoarding. Um, will have ramifications, not just for these negotiations, but for future negotiations in other forum. You know, it, it fundamentally comes down to trust within the multilateral system. Why would low-income nations trust high-income nations? Again, if, if this is the way they, they feel they're being treated, where you know, TRIPS waiver gets blocked for, for far too long, vaccine hoarding is done by high-income nations, that has ramifications well beyond the negotiation of this treaty. So we should be nervous. Um, in terms of what's missing from the IHR, just to go back to IL's, IL's um, question, what's missing is a response. Right. So IHR is meant to be about protect, prevent and respond to infection, uh, health emergencies, infectious disease outbreaks, really. Where's the response? At the moment, there is an awful lot about preparatory work of what your health system should look like in an ideal world so that you can detect outbreaks when they occur. There is a very clear mechanism of reporting on those outbreaks and sharing as much information and associated data as you possibly can largely from low income nations into high income nations. And at present, what that allows is that flow of information from the global south to the global north gives us in the global north just enough time to shut our borders and hoard as many medical countermeasures and vaccines as we can. You only have to look at what happened to South Africa with Omicron to see what the current system perpetuates. Any responses by WHO where they have occurred, I'm thinking of Ebola in the DRC, Ebola in West Africa, have been done on the basis of the, the mandate of the secretariat of the WHO, and it's not grounded within the IHR. So at present, there's no response built into there. So when you are a low income nation and you send out these alerts to, to WHO, you, you, you arrange your healthcare system so you can detect outbreaks and you alert WHO within the 24 hours um, window that IHR demands. What you get is trade and travel restrictions against you and you get your economy decimated. That's what the current IHR system puts in place for you. So what, we've act what we're actually doing is creating a perverse incentive to not report because why would you? Why would you want to be South Africa and Omicron? Why would you want countless other examples of, high, of nations alerting WHO and then having trade and travel restrictions imposed upon them? So what there needs to be is that when that alert kicks in, something actually needs to happen. There actually needs to be support going to high income nations. There needs to be a flow of medical countermeasures back. There needs to be some kind of support being given to these nations. And at the moment, IHR doesn't account for that. That's what's missing.
and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. That's very interesting. I think my, my point, I think maybe that's points again to a broader problem, which I was trying to address it. What counts as a health emergency and what doesn't and what problems which are maybe more, uh, uh, you know, troubling low and middle income countries continuously do not count as a health emergency. Why is, you know, NCDs, why don't we talk about NCDs emergencies, about endemic disease emergency of malaria, TB, etc. But that's for another day. So I just want to, because we're already seven minutes beyond time or eight. So uh, we try to finish this on time usually. Uh, so I want to thank uh, our speakers um, and uh, for really great contributions. I want to thank uh, our students and our audience, anyone who, who joined us for this. We will uh, make the recording available through Tel Aviv University uh, uh, website and through the web uh, page of the new program on law and health. Uh, so you will be able to watch it and send friends who missed it. I think we are going to follow this discussion over the pandemic treaty over the next few years, and it's going to be fascinating for anyone interested in international law and specifically global, global health law. So I'm really grateful for uh, those of you who took the time to, to, to be here, and especially for our speakers. Um, so uh, thank you so much. And uh, our international workshop meets regularly with very interesting uh, topics. You can follow uh, on our website and on uh, Twitter. So everyone is, anyone is welcome to join regularly. And uh, we're going to have on March 31st, a round table on a very different topic of the apartheid uh, 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 argument in Israel-Palestine. And then a very other regular weekly meetings on Monday, usually with one speaker. Uh, so thanks all for attending again. And um, I just wish everyone health at this moment. That's what we need mostly. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Ayan, Thank you. for hosting this. And Thank bye. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. It was a wonderful organization bringing all us together. Thank you, Professor Red Cross. Oh, thank you. Thank you for joining and thanks for putting the link to your paper. And yeah, thank yeah. you, Olga, again for so. uh, jumping in at the last minute and uh, agreeing to. Uh, Very welcome. Uh, thank yeah. you. Um, so I'm. Uh, that's the time when I'm um, uh, removing the spotlight. And anyone who still okay. wants to chat informally. Yeah.